So a very good morning, everybody. It is now 10.30 and we are ready to start our, our webinar. So my name is Maria Kelo. I am the director of ENQA and I will be moderating this morning's uh, webinar session. Um, the webinar today is entitled Protecting and Promoting Academic Integrity, How Quality Assurance Agencies Can Take Action. And this is a, a bit of a special webinar in the ENQA webinar series because it is co-hosted and co-organized with QAA. So warm thanks to QAA and especially to Garrett for the idea and initiative on this topic. And of course, we are very grateful to have Aurelia from SKVC and Deirdre from QQI with us this morning as well. And all of you, there, our colleagues from the ENQA agencies. Um, academic integrity is a key aspect that a key aspect that underpins the trust in higher education uh, quality um, that we talk about a lot. Agencies are often called um, upon to play a role in taking action against, against academic misconduct. Um, and that kind of misconduct can be different kind of things. It can be the use of essay and degree mills, plagiarism, um, forced qualification certificates, uh, and many other things. So this webinar will explore a little bit the practical steps that some of the quality assurance agencies have taken in protecting and promoting academic integrity in their context. But before we start, some technical notes. Um, so um, you will be able to contribute and we very much invite you to do so in the chat, both with your comments as well as with your questions to the panel, to the speakers of today's session. Uh, when you send your messages in the chat, please note that there are two modalities. You can either send your message to only all panelists or to panelists and attendees. So if you want to take part or want your message to go into the generic chat, please make sure that you send it to all panelists and attendees. So we, we are sure to see that. I also would like to inform you that the meeting is being recording, uh, recorded and it will be made available after the event on the ENQA website and YouTube channel together with the uh, materials of this webinar. Um, and now, as this webinar is specifically for ENQA member agencies and affiliate agencies, I have prepared a little poll just to understand where you stand on this. And I'd like to ask uh, now, there you see, there are two brief questions. If you'd like to answer those, so we get an idea of who is around in the room. I'll give you another minute to read through the options, make them quite long. Okay, Jasper, can you show us the results of uh, what came out of the little poll? Right, so the first question is, which of the following describes your agency's current situation the best? And it seems about half of the agencies today present, and we have 54 attendees, um, is that uh, academic fraud is an important issue in our country or in our context, and our agency is actively implementing or developing approaches. Um, about a quarter says it is an important issue, but there is no kind of concrete uh, approach at the moment. And another quarter say that it's not really a, a hugely alarming issue in their context. Um, and uh, then I had a question about what is the biggest threat to academic integrity in your context? And half, half of the respondents say it's the essay or thesis mails. So that's the, the biggest concern, but also 20% say non-accredited incoming cross-border education. So that's also a, a clearly a problematic area. And then, of course, a bunch of other issues. So thanks for taking part in that. We get an idea of where you come from uh, and what are your main concerns. So now we get to the actual uh, interesting part of the webinar, which is that I have um, uh, to, I have the privilege to present the first speaker. Uh, we have three speakers today, each presenting a slightly different approach to the topic, covering the experience of their own agencies work in the area. Um, and also as a reminder, uh, you have received uh, and there are materials related to this webinar available um, on the website. And this also includes many of the links to many of the documents that our speakers will be referring to in their presentations. Um, so please use those resources also after the event. And there is also a link to a piece of work that ENQA conducted a few years ago in a project called uh, CACHE. 
and that is the toolkit for quality assurance agencies and how to deal with cross-border higher education. So it's kind of a toolkit or support tool or advice and it also includes nine brief recommendations uh, um, how to combat uh, fraudulent activities in higher education in especially in the cross-border education area. So do have a look at that as well. Our first speaker is uh, Gareth Grossman, who is Head of Policy and Communications at the QAA in the UK. Uh, and I will now pass on the floor to him uh, straight away. So Gareth, it's all yours. I almost forgot to take myself off mute there. Um, thank you very much indeed, Maria. Um, my name is Gareth Crossman. I'm the Head of Policy and Communications at QA. And what I'm going to be talking to you today is about the work that QA has been doing to promote academic integrity and to combat academic misconduct and really focusing on some of the work that we're doing around essay mills. Um, but there's a couple of things about that. About half of you in that poll have said that they see that as the most significant issue. Um, that means about half don't in your countries, but it's not about specifically about how we tackle essay mills. The real thrust of this is about the promotion of academic integrity. And I think I'm just starting by saying it's something that's really important, I think, for the sector to take positive, to approach positively and to show what they are doing to combat the threat. Now, so what is the threat? Well, in the UK, in terms of essay mills, um, it's a significant issue. Um, there's, this, uh, as you can see, there's a, a report from the BBC a couple of years ago, which says that one in seven internationally, this is based on international research, are paying for university essays. Now, almost by definition, that has to be an estimate. The author of this research makes very clear, you know, that can only give an indication, but that indication is that it's a significant issue. And we know it's a significant issue because um, it's a demand led industry. And we um, we in the UK and I'm sure in other countries, we have eff effectively what are price comparison sites, which list from, in this case, UK top writers, one to 946 separate essay mill sites. And those have been added to at around the range of 15 a month. So it's a significant issue and it's a growing issue. So what are we doing about it? Well, there are quite a few things. I've only got 15 minutes, so I'm just going to touch on a couple of them. Um, in, 19, in 1917, sorry, in 2017, uh, we published SAML uh, guidance to help institutions deal with SAMLs and, and contract cheating, generally um, a, a broader term for SAML in, um, in their institutions. And we updated that and reissued new guidance uh, last summer. And there are a couple of reasons why it wasn't long between the first and second edition. One was because we needed to add some quite COVID specific context, but also um, this is such a fast moving area. Um, these are sophisticated entities. We found the initial uh, guidance was getting out of date quite quickly. So we surveyed UK higher education institutions. We asked them what they liked about the guidance, what thoughts they had about how it can be improved. We asked them, for example, as a good practice. We had input from sector experts and from students. And this is a point I really want to stress. It's written for the UK higher education sector but the contents can be applied globally. Wherever you were, there is, there is content in this guidance that will be relevant to your jurisdiction. Now, I'm not going to, the, the, the guidance is available um, with the materials, so I'm not going to spend much time talking about those. I do want to mention some of the key recommendations, but what it covered was how you educate and train staff, how you educate students, reducing opportunities to cheat. The wording there is actually quite important. We call it reducing opportunities to cheat. When the, publish was, when the guidance was first published, we call it preventing. But the reality is you can't prevent. You can take action to minimize the risk, but we don't want to give the impression that you can, that, that you can um, assess out the prospect of cheating. We, the guidance then covers ways in which you can detect use of, of, of software and so on, and what institutional regulations and policies you might want in place to, um, to you would need to have in place to ensure consistent institutional approach. Now, 
when we published it, we sought ministerial endorsements and got them from three of the four UK governments. The Northern Ireland government at the time wasn't operating, so we weren't able to collect the full set. Now, this is really important because it's not just about institutional action. You need to show and demonstrate and get sign up from governments because they're the ones who can provide the policy framework to allow action to be effectively taken. Um, so I'm just going to touch on some of the key findings and recommendations. Now, essay mills are, are, they are effective. Many of them are very effective marketing bodies. They use the channels that students use. They will target students through those channels. And we are increasingly hearing of practices such as blackmail and extortion. And the reason for that, and this is why students need to be educated, is once you've used an essay mill they have you over a barrel they can they they will go and threaten to go to your institution and tell you tell them what you've done possibly the most important of all the recommendations is you need to have an institution-wide approach what the survey we did showed was that you get pockets of good practice often within institutions but that institution-wide approach is often lacking so it's important to identify a strategic lead ideally this would be a paid post within the institution but that might not be possible so an individual or ideally a group of senior with it, senior staff within the institution with responsibility for staff training and institutional co coordination the next recommendation it goes back to what i've just said you can, des you can reduce the opportunity to cheat, but never think that you can design assessments that can be considered cheat proof. Next, and this is, this is based on some uh, Australian research um, that while technology can help detect the use of SA mills, um, particularly now there is technology which, which helps identify authors as opposed to what was traditional plagiarism software, which might not pick up a bespoke essay, which is what most SA mills are. But that technology is most effective when used by experienced staff and particularly if they have a knowledge of the student body. Next key finding, this reflects something I've already said, they exploit students who are vulnerable in access, and this is particularly the case during COVID. We saw examples of marketing, not only directly using those channels that students use, but going on about COVID, about the stress, about the anxiety. They, they are clever and they know what they're doing. And then lastly, and this might be obvious, but it's really important that students should be aware of or easy to able to access information and procedures to follow to report suspicions of academic misconduct. Again, can happen within pockets within institutions, but it's important that's an institution wide approach. So that's the guidance. Um, and but we felt after publishing the guidance that as well, we wanted to really this was something we needed to build on. And we we felt that it's really important that the higher education sector is seen to get on the front foot to show that it is being positive and proactive in protecting academic integrity. So we developed and this was um, uh, drawing on some work that had been done in Australia. We've developed an academic integrity charter. Now, a couple of things about this. Um, that uh, it's a principles based charter. It's not guidance. It's something which we are asking institutions to sign up to. And in the UK, certainly it's not a regulatory tool. We don't we're not measuring or auditing against it. It is for institutions to demonstrate their commitment to academic integrity. We launched it, we, we published it at the end of last year and because we wanted to make sure that there was lots of, there was plenty of sign up where we've now got over a hundred colleges and signatories having signed up to it. We drafted it in collaboration with experts, um, higher education institutions and students. And it demonstrates the sector getting on the, on the front foot, taking action. In April next month, we're gonna launch it. We now got over a hundred signatories. So that's a really positive message we can send out. Again, we're going to seek ministerial endorsements to say the sector really takes academic integrity seriously. The charter contains several principles. I'll mention those in a minute. And as I said, it's the positive thing. It's about protecting and promoting academic integrity. So I'll just, briefly touch on the principles in the charter. Um, everyone is responsible for a whole community approach. That basically, it means that everyone in an institution is responsible. It's not a person's job. Everyone has responsibility. The whole community approach itself 
that really touches on what I've been talking about in the guidance. It's about education for staff and students. It's about looking at ways to reduce chances, it's about detection. It's all parts of an institution joining up to promote academic integrity. Then working together as a sector, that's the non-institutional point as a non-specific institution. When, when we started doing this work and up until relatively recently, you'd find even when institutions were acknowledging that there was an issue within the sector, they'd go, yeah, it's an issue, but for them, not us, them. I think collectively that position has changed and that was why it's so important to get that charter with the signatories because it shows this is an institution-wide issue. Engaging and empowering students and engaging and empowering staff, what I've been talking about, making sure they're aware, particularly students, because some of the most effective practice we've seen within institutions is when they're student led and uh, it's students not be told by the by lecturers don't cheat but students taking the initiative to say to their peers let stand up for academic integrity um consistent and effective institutional policies and practice again might seem obvious seen example of institutional policy dating back to the 1970s on academic misconduct clearly out of date so it's important to make sure those are maintained and institutional autonomy and what that's really saying is that it's not down to QAA, it's not down to governments, it's down to, it, they can they can provide, then we can encourage and so on, but it's really down to an institutional level to take the lead. So that's a really whistle stop tour. I'm just gonna mention before I finish, just a couple of other things and um, just say, you know, what else are we doing? What else is happening? It's a global issue. There is no simple or single solution. These are commercial entities. They exist to make money. That's the only reason. If it's made more difficult to make money, they don't have any reason to continue. So, and as you're going to hear about legislation from Deirdre in a moment, I won't, I won't talk about it, but we're lobbying to have the UK governments introduce legislation to criminalise SA mills. We campaign to raise awareness in the media. We work with our international partners and hopefully we'll be working with some of you. We look to challenge online platforms. We lobby Google, Facebook, PayPal, YouTube to say to them, don't accept money from these entities which are making a living out of cheating. So that's a very quick tour of some of the work we're doing. And if there's one message I'd leave you with, it's about working with the sector, being proactive, showing that the sector is taking action. And the things that I've talked about, everything that I've talked about today can be look, you can adapt it, you can look at it at, an, at, a, at your own, within your own jurisdictions and work with your sectors to take action. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Gareth. Uh, that was an excellent uh, run through. Uh, a lot of important information there. Uh, we have a little bit of time now for uh, questions you might have. Um, uh, please write them in the chat so I can pick them up. Um, or if the fellow um, presenters have any questions to Gareth at this point. Uh, there is a question about what, what do you mean by challenging online platforms? Could you elaborate on that a little? Absolutely. Sorry. Yes. Yeah, so what I mean is that companies like Google, Facebook, PayPal and YouTube, um, they will get paid for advertising. And I'll give you an example. YouTube were were um, had um, influencer videos. These are people who influence and they have hundreds of thousands, sometimes millions of followers. And SA Mills were paying them um, to advertise SA Mills services during uh, during their their their, their um, uh, videos. And uh, interesting, noticing a lot of these were targeted at pre higher education students at um, at secondary at secondary level. So we worked with the BBC and we went to YouTube and said, "You are allowing cheating through your channels." can you stop? We wrote to Google to say the same thing. Don't allow for paid for advertising. If you starve these companies of the oxygen of online, of being able to use online platforms, then it makes them more difficult to market. Of course, that would be helped considerably if these were criminal entities, which is why we're also lobbying for legislation to criminalize. Very clear. Good. I don't see for the moment any questions, but we have about half an hour at the end time to uh, 25 minutes at least to go through um, 
additional questions, so please keep them coming. We'll take note of those and uh, we'll make sure to address them as well. Um, good. Thanks, Garrett. Thanks very much. Um, next um, in line, we have uh, Deirdre Stritch, who's the manager of approval and monitoring at the QQI um, um, in Ireland. So now, Deirdre, um, I will um, leave the floor to you for your input. Thanks, you. Thank you, Maria, and good morning, everybody. Um, as Maria noted, my name is Deirdre Stritch. I'm Manager for Quality Assurance Approval and Monitoring at QQI, uh, Quality and Qualifications Ireland. And I'm going to give you just a brief overview of the activities that have been taking place in Ireland in relation to academic integrity over the last um, 18 months. Given the time available this morning, this will of necessity be a bit of a highlights package, um, but I and my colleagues who are also here today will be more than happy to have maybe a more in-depth conversation with anyone who is interested after the webinar um, and I have um, I'm more than happy for, for Maria and her colleagues to share um, my contact details in that regard. Sorry this is not moving forward for me. Okay um, so just for anybody who may not be aware um, of, of who QQI is and what our role is, um, QQI is, is relatively unusual in agency terms in that we have um, quite a broad remit uh, spanning um, a number of functions. So um, it is first and foremost a quality assurance body for providers of education and training in Ireland, um, both vocational and higher education. And indeed, in some respects, English language training also. So effectively, all education and training outside of the school system. But it's also an awarding body. It makes qualifications for learners across all of those um, sectors, vocational and higher education, and indeed in small part also for English language. And in addition to both of those roles, and indeed the thing that ties them together, um, is the our national framework of qualifications, of which KQI is also the custodian. So on the basis of all of that, uh, we have a broad and multifaceted interest in the standards of national qualifications and the standard of national awards. And central to that uh, is the issue of academic integrity and ensuring that our education and training providers have a culture, a robust, strong culture of academic integrity um, embedded within them. So back in 2019, which feels like a bit of a lifetime ago at this stage, uh, new legislation was passed in Ireland. There was a new amendment act, which um, introduced a number of changes to the legislation uh, which um, underpins QQI. And that new uh, amendment act, it strengthened QQI's regulatory powers in a number of areas, and it created some new functions for us as an agency. And one of the things that it did was to introduce some new offences. So Section 43A of that Act now provides a statutory basis for the prosecution of those who facilitate or assist or enable in any way um, cheating by learners. Um, it's also now an offence to advertise cheating services. Um, so the, the essay mills and so on that Gareth was referring to there in his presentation. And it's also now an offence to publish advertisements for those cheating services. And QQI is the body responsible for bringing prosecutions under this section of the Act. I haven't reproduced the, the exact wording of that legislation here. It's reasonably lengthy and it's written in, in, in fairly typical legalese. But for anybody who's interested in, in looking at that um, directly themselves, I have included the links here, uh, both for the overall act and for that, sec um, that um, piece, section 43A. And I did share that pre um, earlier with um, Maria and colleagues. So I think you may have that in the information that was provided to you um, in advance of the webinar. And I can share it afterwards for anyone who's interested in any case. Um, what's interesting to note um, about that piece of legislation is that the wording of it um, casts a very wide net. So it brings within its scope anybody who um, assists a learner to cheat in any way. So through the provision of answers for an exam, who impersonates a learner uh, in an exam context and, and, and or assists in the exam or in advance of it, uh, anybody who provides an assignment or an essay or part thereof um, in advance of an exam, all of that is, is brought within the remit. And what that means is that anybody who assists is technically breaching the laws. So that we know from, from feedback that we've had from our higher education institutions in particular, 
still tends to be in the main um, fellow learners, for example, family and friends, etc. And in addition to the essay mills, etc., that that um, Gareth has been has referred to. It is not our intention as the, the regulatory body or as the agency responsible for this piece of legislation to pursue legal action against those individual instances of learner to learner or peer to peer um, cheating or indeed um, assistance by family members and friends that may have overstepped the mark. Um, that, Pursuing, a, pursuing legal cases in those contexts um, is expensive, it's time consuming, it's not a particularly useful um, use of resources. And so our intention instead is to focus on um, at scale for profit uh, facilitation of learner cheating. And so that really is then those essay writing services, the assignment writing services, etc., the essay mills in, in colloquial terms that Gareth was referring to. So that's just on, on how the legislation is being addressed. Um, we have to date, so in the, the almost 18 months that the legislation has been on the books, um, our, our approach has been to focus primarily in the first instance on higher education. That's not because this issue is exclusive to higher education, as Gareth mentioned, we are aware of um, these companies targeting learners both in the school system which is excluded from the legislation, it should be said, but also in vocational education and training. But higher education um, was considered to be of highest risk, um, given that learners emerging there are often going into professional practice, et cetera. And so um, we decided to address that area first, but we will be extending the program of activity into further education and training, as it's termed in Ireland, um, over the course of 2021 and beyond. We've also acknowledged that whilst having legislation is incredibly important and we're grateful that we have that additional tool available to us to utilise, and I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about how it has been used. Um, it's not the only or even indeed potentially the most important tool that we have at our disposal. Um, fundamentally, as, as Gareth rightly noted, this is about what happens within institutions. It's about ensuring um, that there is a broad culture of academic integrity uh, embedded at all levels of the institution, right through from management and governance uh, down to frontline academic and support staff, and that learners are, are a critical part of that conversation and dialogue and are themselves um, change leaders within their institutions on this as a topic. And so our approach has very, been very much about uh, collaboration and partnership. And that's a reflection of, of how PQI addresses its other functions with its providers in any case. Um, we have focused as well on communication, ensuring that all relevant stakeholders um, in this conversation are aware uh, of the new legislation, are aware of their roles and are actively um, contributing to the discussion how we can move forward nationally on this. We are therefore not focusing, at certainly at this point in time, and it's not um, an immediate ambition, uh, on prosecutions through a formal legal unit. What we are looking at is adopting a holistic approach um, about raising awareness, and, and we'll look at some of the initiatives undertaken in that regard, um, and fundamentally increasing institutional capacity and skills um, to ensure that, that institutions and their staff are well positioned to minimise, as, as Gareth mentioned, the opportunities for academic misconduct in whatever form. And so part of that is understanding these new emergent forms of academic misconduct, um, these essay mills, their, their modus operandi, their working models, how, how they target learners. Um, because it's not until we understand how that, that new system works that we can target it and address it effectively. We also want to modify learner behaviour and disrupt the business model that SA Mills use to target Irish learners. Um, so, for example, we, we know from international research that learners are much more likely to engage uh, in academic misconduct to cheat or to use these SML services when they're feeling under pressure, um, when they're perhaps less aware of um, their institutional policies around academic integrity, etc. So it's to ensure that learners, um, one, are aware that this is not just um, a violation perhaps of their institutional academic integrity, uh, codes of behaviour and codes of conduct, um, but it is also a, a criminal offence. But beyond that, that learners are aware of the supports available to them should they need them um, to enable them to engage effectively with their learning. Um, so the legislation is important. Um, but perhaps one of its most important impacts in an Irish context has been the, the soft 
uh, benefits that it has gained us in terms of being a catalyst for action at a senior level. It has surfaced this issue um, as one of, of significant importance, um, which requires uh, involvement and investment at a senior level nationally in government and also to the agency and then within institutions. So uh, I'm going to look at this in two respects and so just very briefly to mention one of the things that has happened as a direct as a hard consequence of the legislation and then I'm going to look at some of maybe the, the softer consequences but no less important ones um, uh, of, the, as of the introduction of the legislation in 2019. So as I noted just a moment ago, um, it is now an offence to advertise and publish advertisements for cheating services. Um, now Ireland is it's a small country and from what we can see from our research, very few if any uh, of these SA mills are based domestically and so therefore would fall within the remit of the legislation anyway. But what we have seen um, to a lesser extent are individuals, maybe graduates or and so on, who are offering um, their services, their bespoke essay writing services um, on local advertising platforms. So we made, we entered into an arrangement last year with a company called Distilled SCH. Uh, it um, is an operator of the two two of the largest advertising platforms in Ireland, Dundeal and adverts.ie. And as part of that arrangement, Distilled SEH will remove from those platforms, from those sites, um, any and all advertisements for cheating services uh, that we have identified to it. And we're now concluding a formal process for information sharing um, with Distilled NCH on persons who have placed those advertisements so that we can then follow up directly with the individuals who have been offering essay writing services. Um, this is a model that so far is working well and it's intended that that, that is the model that we will replicate um, where possible with other um, publishers and platforms. Then in terms of those perhaps softer impacts, um, but as I say, nonetheless, important ones and possibly even more important ones. One of the first actions that we took following the commencement of the legislation back at the end of 2019 in November 2019 was the establishment of a national academic integrity network. Um, it comprises membership from across all of our public higher education institutions, universities, institutes of technology, um, as well as uh, those private higher education institutions who had at that time recently had their QA uh, procedures approved by QQI. So that would be kind of the larger, um, mostly Dublin based private higher education institutions. And there are also student representatives, um, in addition to representatives from our, our uh, Union of Students in Ireland. Uh, and as I mentioned before, it is, it is important to us and it will remain important going forward that students um, have a critical place at the table and that their voice is heard in all of this. So this kind of comes back to a little bit of something that, that Gareth is mentioning. It's in, that members of our network are institutional leads in the area of academic integrity within their own institutions. Uh, many are registrars or operating within that space. Um, some are um, QA officers, teaching and learning, um, deans of teaching and learning, etc. And it's chaired by um, one of our re registrars from Dublin City University. And that's important because we need to get to a place where this is an issue that is um, high on the agenda at a senior level within institutions so that we can then have a cascade effect that institutional policies and procedures for academic integrity are robust they're stronger up to date um, and that they uh, the issue then can flow down can cascade down within the institution eqi is the yes. five yeah Right, perfect. Hi, hi. PQI is facilitator of the network, we're secretary to it, and we publish all documentation um, relevant to it on uh, the web page, which is here, and I've circulated that link as well. Not going to go into this in detail, but essentially just to say that the primary purpose of the network is to ensure that collectively, nationally, we have a better understanding of the academic integrity landscape here. There's lots of research coming um, from other jurisdictions and we need to know what the picture is in Ireland so that we can develop targeted and effective approaches to address the issue here. Um, and it is to um, identify good practice and to develop guidance for institutions. So it's institutions helping themselves to ensure that we have a robust culture of academic integrity um, within our institutions. And the network has convened three working groups to progress those objectives. 
So a couple of these, some useful things that will be coming forward, not, not able to share them just yet, will be coming shortly. So there are two, the, the network was um, impressively busy last year, despite all of the other challenges that were being faced. And so shortly at the end of April, um, there will be two documents um, published in the public domain. One is a principles and national lexicon. It became immediately apparent to us that we were not all um, using words in the same way. And that uh, use of language that, that um, was in, was hindering our progress. And so the development of a national lexicon was identified as a primary um, initial step that would be necessary to make progress elsewhere. And that's now completed. And I say that lexicon will be available shortly. The other thing the network has done was to produce uh, interim non-statutory quality assurance guidelines and academic integrity. And those guidelines are aimed at um, higher education institutions and they are they focus on four chapters um, embedding a culture of academic integrity um, preventing academic misconduct or minimizing opportunities for misconduct detecting it when it happens because we're aware that detecting use of essay mills is much more challenging than perhaps detecting plagiarism or other more traditional forms of cheating and then dealing with academic misconduct when it happens so those will become available uh, in a month's time and um, they will then support the next steps of the, of the network. So they're looking at research and guidance on e-proctoring, um, very important since COVID hit and we're all working online, developing a framework for academic integrity in institutions um, to help best identify um, how best to uh, detect instances of contract cheating when they happen. They'll make template documents available to staff. So again, it's the peer-to-peer -peer, um, assistance piece. Um, data collection. Um, and guidance around how data uh, and categorization of academic misconduct can be done uh, at an institutional basis so that we can have a much more holistic and robust sense of, of, of the landscape in Ireland. And then there will be a, a series of enhancement events, so uh, workshops, webinars, etc, cetera, etc. Cetera. So finally, just in conclusion, next steps for us, uh, we're looking at further ways of implementing that legislation effectively, um, more initiatives to inform, to educate, to support, etc. There has been a student facing campaign, um, and I think I, I think I did send the link of that around, um, addressing students, making sure they're aware of the new legislation, making sure they're aware of the risks uh, of using SA mills. Uh, I have some anecdotal stuff based on what um, Gareth just said about SA mills contracting institutions to to inform on learners who have used them. That is. I based on my desk at the moment where that has actually happened um, and making learners aware of the supports available to them within their institutions um, so that they don't feel compelled to cheat in the first instance. And from our perspective as an agency, I suppose, first and foremost, we are looking for opportunities to include a focus on academic integrity into our routine regulatory interactions with providers. So through QA approval, through annual quality reports, um, through institutional cyclical reviews or audits, and through program validation or approval, data returns, etc. We want to get to a position whereby academic integrity is a standing item on the agenda of the of the academic committees within institutions, that there is an office and an individual in institutions responsible for academic integrity in the way that there is for quality assurance, where that's possible in terms of scale, etc. So that this is taken seriously at a senior level and that it has um, an appropriate rollout throughout the institution. So Maria, that's, that's it from me. Perfect. Thank you very much, Deirdre. Um, there are Excuse me, there are a couple of questions I would like, thank you, a couple of questions that I think are directly to you, so I would like to bring those up now. One question is, what concerns a soft approach to learners' behaviour? Um, do you think that measures should be taken already at lower levels of education for that to be really effective? So I... I I understand from that question is that kind of a, 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 the question is relating to the preparedness of learners to engage effectively with higher education. Yes, I think that's certainly an issue. Something that we've seen in the last 12 months, maybe, as we've been working on this, is that um, learners, well, first of all, that the essay mills aren't simply targeting higher education students. They are also targeting schools and they are also targeting vocational education and training. So it's quite possible that some learners who are coming into to HE have already had an experience of using essay mills and it may have perhaps in some 
instances become a part of their norm. And so there's a little bit of unlearning to be done at that stage. And so that is why um, part of our ambition for 2021 is to move beyond HE and start looking at further education and training, as, as we term it, to ensure that the message is getting out appropriately in that sector as well. But there is a little bit, I think, perhaps is a longer term conversation to be had, at least for us in Ireland, and that is with the school system. So to ensure that learners emerging from the school system um, already have an, a basic understanding of these issues, which isn't always the case, frankly, at the moment, and that they are entering into HE with at least some of the skill sets and knowledge required to effectively uh, engage with their learning at that level, and therefore perhaps minimise the risk of them um, engaging in academic misconduct. Mm -hmm. Thank you. There are there are many questions for you, so I will not be able to address this all. And, and also, by the way, uh, Brian, I've taken note of your question, which was, I think, the first question to come up, really. Um, and I will keep that for the generic discussion. So I uh, don't don't worry. I have not forgotten, Brian, your question. But a question to you, Sildiri. Um, how many people are in charge of this mission or this kind of um, topic in your agency? Do they work alone or do they work as a network with higher education institutions? So that's a tricky one. It's a bit of a bone of contention for us here. So we have the legislation, but we don't have a formal academic integrity unit, something I would love to have within our agency and something which I would say, frankly, would be an ideal scenario, no more than needing institutions to have a dedicated um, staff. Uh, looking at this topic, I think it's ideal that, that, the, that the agency would too. So at the moment, this is one element of a much broader work package that I have. Um, I, there's another staff member, I think about 50% of her time is on assisting the network, the National Academic Integrity Network that I was talking about. And there are some additional administrative staff that provide assistance to that too. Um, our communication staff um, dedicate a lot of their time on this as well, because as I said, the communications piece has been important. So at the moment, it is drawing on the time of existing staff whose primary function may be in another area. Um, but that is something that we are negotiating uh, with our overall ministry to, to um, progress, because it, it would be ideal to have somebody focusing on this exclusively, potentially as part of a wider unit. Could I, could I just throw in it, uh, just a second, just in Australia, the Australian government they provides <laughs> four million Australian <laughs> dollars a year to Texa, the agency there, to in this area. And they have yeah. a unit which is funded through that. So the Australians in many ways are taking the lead. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's really interesting to hear because we've been contacted, I mean, not really contacted, but we noticed that in a document uh, provided by the European Commission, they had actually brought up this idea that quality assurance agencies across Europe should have this kind of academic integrity officers. And then there should be a network of those officers to support, uh, to bring forward this agenda. And, um, and so that's definitely something for us to explore a little bit if there is an interest in the ENQA community, perhaps uh, starting with kind of an informal, uh, even those people who don't really have those millions to do that job, but, uh, but to just <laughs> start to connect and, and see, you know, what they can, can learn from each other. Final, very brief um, uh, question or kind of a confirmation. Um, is it correct to understand that law is harsh on the providers and softer on the students? Yes, I think that's probably the case. Um, well, it, the implementation of the law potentially is, as I said, the way the law is phrased uh, means that in theory, we could prosecute individual learners who assist another learner to cheat, um, but that isn't the focus on how we're implementing it. So yeah, I, I think it's fair to say in summary that that's how we're approaching the implementation of the legislation. Mm -hmm. And then uh, if, um, actually a very final uh, question at this stage, and that's also partly to, to Gareth, so it was brought up under your, your presentation, um, but too late for us to pick it up, <clears throat> was um, would you say the legislation is, uh, has, has an impact? Is it effective? Or is it just that these, these, these kind of companies or, or individuals find always a way then to go around it? So what's, what's your assessment? Do you have a positive uh, regard to legislation as a supporting academic integrity or not very effective? Oh, okay, um, I mean, there's a couple of things that riders you have to put around in relation to legislation. Firstly, criminal legislation applies to that country. So it applies to, if in terms of an SAML, it applies to an SAML that operates within that jurisdiction. Now, so, this is a global issue as we keep saying so it's not going to be a magic bullet but there's evidence in Australia already that SA mills 
that have been operating in Australia, where there's also criminal law, have ceased operation or moved operations elsewhere. The couple of other points, there's something I touched on on which Deirdre has spoken about. Mm -hmm. It makes it a lot easier to engage with the platforms that provide them with the lifeblood that they need through their through um, through being able to market if they are criminal entities. Um, and thirdly, from a student perspective, um, that when students understand that if they engage with these, they are engaging with criminal entities. It's a very, very strong message for them to know that this is something they should not do. So, I mean, you know, in a way, you shouldn't really say you introduce criminal law because of the wider impact that it has. But realistically, you're not going to have in any jurisdiction hundreds of prosecutions. That's not going to happen. What it does do is it's part of that process of showing that these are pariahs, these are criminal entities and they cannot operate and you cannot engage with them in a way that is legal. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Good, excellent. We got some conversation going and we'll keep keep those comments and questions coming and feel free, of course, also the speakers to respond to also in the chat. Uh, and, and I saw somebody from Georgia, Lali, you shared an experience from your context. Uh, very welcome for all of you to share your observations and experiences and good practice there. So. Now we have the next, uh, the third presentation, um, Aurelia Valekine, Deputy Director of SKVC in Lithuania. So um, Aurelia, I leave the floor to you. Thank you very much, Maria. Uh, my presentation will have two parts into it. Uh, as was just mentioned at the beginning of our webinar, uh, there are very many aspects to academic integrity, and I will touch upon two of them, and that is on cross-border cooperation between quality assurance agencies, uh, and then on uh, cooperation within the country. And of course, I will be bringing examples of Lithuania to that. Uh, so first of all, cross-border cooperation aspect. Uh, there is a very great tool developed in the support by one of European Union funded projects that Maria just mentioned at the beginning, the CACHA project, which uh, provides recommendations for quality assurance agencies and other stakeholders, what they could do. Uh, so uh, in my several next slides, I will bring some quotes from that and the approach that uh, we took in Lithuania in uh, implementing them. So the first question is, uh, what is the overall quality assurance framework in the country? Is it clear and uh, information accessible on uh, inbound and outbound uh, cross-border higher education is of vital importance? I'm sure every country has uh, an elaborate framework. This is an example of what we have in Lithuania. And to begin with, uh, higher education provision and uh, services related to higher education is subject to licensing. Uh, those licenses are issued by the Ministry of Education, Science and Research. Our agency, SKVC, is included in the process of assessing those applications. And there is also an intermediary step where the State Security Department is also looking who are the persons behind private providers wishing to establish themselves in the country so that there are no threats for the national security. Education has large impact on individuals, but also society in general. So this is a concern. We saw several attempts of bogus providers to establish themselves in Lithuania, which was seen as an attractive place because being European Union member country and uh, having the reputation of uh, participation in the European higher education area. This was seen as a possible hub uh, for online provision from some third countries, etc. So uh, there was a strictened approach to uh, tighten the legislation regarding uh, establishing uh, for any entities that wish to provide higher education in Lithuania. Of course, following the European standards and guidelines for quality assurance, internal quality assurance, including academic uh, integrity, is the primary responsibility of higher education institutions. But of course, there is a framework supporting them in this work. Uh, the mandatory procedures 
uh, includes ex ante and ex post institutional reviews. Ex ante, that is for the licensing purpose, and ex post, these reviews are conducted by my agency. Uh, there are also ex ante program evaluations in order to launch uh, provision of any higher education study program. And recently we moved to cluster evaluation and accreditation of programs according to the study fields. Uh, so this is the framework and we provide information on this framework on our website. Uh, our mandate extends to the national qualification framework levels five to seven. That is from short cycle, education programs to the master level. Uh, there is also clarity regarding how other agencies that are trustworthy and listed on ECRA uh, could uh, offer their services to institutions. And the third cycle, the doctoral provision is under the research council. We are lucky to have a separate institution in Lithuania. From 2011, there was an office of the Ombudsperson for Academic Ethics and Procedures established. So we work in close collaboration with this office regarding those topics. Uh, so the question for the agent is uh, looking from the uh, perspective of cross-border provision is really what is the mandate? Uh, what we can do. Um, and uh, as said, uh, we have a mandate to uh, look at the licensing issue. Um, the legislation also provides that when there is a wish from a branch of a foreign provider to establish themselves on Lithuanian soil, that there should be a mandatory phase of consultations with public authorities from the country of origin. And as Lithuanian Quality Assurance Agency, uh, we have a mandate to follow our institutions wherever they are based. Uh, on the main campus, in another municipality in Lithuania, or indeed if they wish to move abroad. There were such instances and we collaborated with agencies, including with our colleagues from QQI, uh, as there is an emigre Lithuanian community in Ireland. Uh, there is separate legislation in Lithuania regarding uh, those higher education providers which for the reasons of prosecution cannot freely operate uh, in their countries. Um, Lithuania is a democratic country and offering uh, shelter for those institutions. There is clarity that those institutions uh, have um, uh, their own situations and context and concerns. So our external quality assurance framework is adapted for those situations. There is special attention for those. And as for the branches of foreign higher education institutions that operate in Lithuania, they are not left alone. We also have a mandate to uh, perform an external institutional review, but we are not passing the decision. So basically this is the enhancement uh, oriented review and uh, other oversight is by the sending country and their external quality assurance agency. Um, the capture toolkit uh, makes it um, a case that it's very important to have a white list of institutions uh, so that eventually everybody is informed about the institutions. In Lithuania, we have a state register of uh, institutions, of qualifications, of learning and study programs, and that register contains information on everybody, on state-owned public institutions and private providers as well. Everybody is listed and also branches of foreign institutions. So far, we have only one such institution coming from the neighboring country, Poland. And as you see here in the print screen, it is listed under our registers as legally operating in Lithuania. Now, uh, the information provision on quality assurance and the results is very important function for us as quality assurance agencies. So the question is, how do we publish those results? And again, in case of Lithuania, 
the results of study programs are uh, published in that state register next to the uh, data on study programs. In addition, we are also working on uh, publishing institutional review reports there. Currently, they are not listed there. They are available only through our website. Our website has both programs and institutions. And of course, we are working with the latest tools provided by ECAR to publish reports there. Uh, we are a small higher education system in Lithuania, but we have our own peculiarities, so to say. So, for example, Catholic education provision is regulated by the bilateral treaty between the Holy See and Lithuania. And uh, it provides that study programs and institutional reviews for those are done by the uh, Holy See's agency, Avepro, but we also take measures to publish the results since these institutions are Lithuanian institutions. So under our website, uh, everybody can see what was uh, the uh, evaluation report and the decision attached to it. And when it comes to the study programs of the branch of this one institution that we have, uh, it is done by the colleagues in Poland. Now, uh, the second part as to the enabling on the country level, as mentioned, we work with the uh, academic person institution, and this is an example of the conference that we had last year. Of course, it was marked by the COVID but, and by the move to the remote teaching and learning and academic integrity came as a very prominent issue there. So uh, in their own uh, right, the office did the study on, on the situation uh, and the academic ethics uh, issues as exposed by students. Uh, the result of it is that uh, cheating and all kinds of uh, uh, problematic behavior be became more visible. And here you see on the left side of my slides uh, those exact examples related to this online provision. And that included cheating during assessment, also problematic communication, disruption, uh, not only during assessment, but during the teaching process and various kinds of additional violations of intellectual property rights in addition to uh, what was usually, so to say, on the menu. The uh, office produced the set of guidelines to institutions and we also uh, took efforts to publicize them. And those guidelines uh, were around five issues. First of all, the importance of development of the culture of ethics, then taking preparatory measures. Uh, and these are measures in response to the pandemic and this blended learning and the remote provision. Uh, that was a very particular situation. Uh, the great deal of work needs to be done taking preventive measures uh, to discourage unethical behavior. And there are uh, several aspects and ideas you see listed on my slide, what could be done. Uh, the, the next tool, of course, is the increased control. Uh, it's not only the issue of um, engaging with students and explaining and working with students and the staff, but also having tools to actually uh, effectively work with the fraud that is detective and also taking some punitive actions from the softer ones to the more severe ones. These guidelines, unfortunately, are available only in Lithuanian, but you see the essence of them listed here, and I trust that they are applicable in very many national contexts. In summary, we believe that information provision is a key, uh, and also a collective action is important. Thank you. 
Thank you very much, Aurelia. Also managed to cover a lot of ground in quite a short time. Um, I'm inviting people to, to pose a question to you um, if they have some uh, direct questions. Um, you mentioned, uh, Aurelia, a whitelist, and you also mentioned DECAR. Uh, almost instantly, at the same time, I posted a link to the chat. Um, but there is a question, is there, like a, is there a blacklist? Uh, should there be a blacklist? The blacklist is a very uh, tricky issue, and here we have competence both as external quality assurance agency and similar as our colleagues in QQI, we are also uh, the academic information and recognition center for foreign qualifications. Uh, so uh, from, from the ENIC NARIC perspective, uh, I can say that yes, sharing of blacklists uh, is possible, but this uh, since this is a very subtle issue, this is basically done within uh, trusted communities and uh, the closed mailing list, so to say. Uh, the widely accepted approach and not to be dragged into the legal disputes with those various kinds of bogus providers is to actually take uh, uh, another um, approach and that is to publish the whitelist. And we make sure to say that if you don't find an institution in the whitelist, then it's not a legally provision in Lithuania. Yeah, thank you. That's very clear. Um, any other direct questions that could be for Aurelia? Um, I'm trying to monitor, but uh, but nothing directly on uh, on what you just said. So I would like to ask you first uh, the question that uh, Brian um, posted already very early on in the webinar. Um, you know, uh, related to Gareth's presentation, the the charter has a non-regulatory character. We've talked about different also soft tools. There is the legislation, but also many soft tools. So, um, and you referred a little bit to the work of agencies, what agencies can concretely do within their regular external quality assurance activities, particularly related to cross-border um, higher education. Are there any other elements of this fraudulent provision that could be or should be addressed or are addressed in your context through the regular external quality assurance? Thank you. Uh, we have an issue of um, ethics and integrity included under our procedures. In all types of procedures, there is uh, at least a question of the policies available developed by institutions and also how exactly they're enacted in their context. And one particular aspect for institutions is to be uh, very conscious in developing international ties and cooperation with other institutions and checking their status that uh, uh, they are in a company of good friends, not in a company of bad guys. Uh, so uh, we, we are talking a lot with institutions regarding those issues and the responsibility of the senior leadership, as was just mentioned by Gareth, that it takes a whole institution approach. So for the leaders of institutions, when we had events, we were actually emphasizing what is their responsibility to make sure that the policy is in the right place and that the policy is covering pertinent issues. And then uh, when we go down to the implementation of procedures, of course, they are reflective of the entire institutional policies, but uh, um, as institutions have units and departments, everybody has to be uh, vigilant and take action as appropriate in their context. So yes, we are looking into those issues during the regular procedures and also by dialogue with institutions. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Aurelia. Gareth, maybe you want to comment on that same, uh, same question. It was initially um, directed to you. Um, and also, Deirdre, if you would like to join us with your camera as well, uh, we can, you, you, you'd be also welcome to comment on this then. Um, yeah, I mean, absolutely, this has either direct or indirect relevance to um, quality assurance 
um, processes and regulations, um, regulatory frameworks within e e each uh, nation. <clears throat> so, for example, in the UK, the UK Quality Code for Higher Education, which is embedded into the regulatory frameworks one way or another in all UK nations, um, does have within that various uh in not specifically about academic uh, integrity in the in the regulatory part there's 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 elements of that in the guidance um but which you know talks about um uh that the provider designs and delivers high quality courses and has appeal there are talk about appeals process and so on so yes but we are very consciously looking at this and talking about this and the narrative that we're using is about in the enhancement space because of course it has its regulatory re relevance you have to ensure that institutions um that are um, are not falling foul of 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 any regulatory baselines but it's important for the sector to be seen as the as 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 engaging with and um and proactively acting and working with agencies and with governments to enhance because that otherwise it can look defensive being done too whereas we want to be seen and we think it's vital that the sector is seen to be positively engaging so that's why in my presentation i was really focusing on the those kind of enhancement areas rather than talking about it in in, in terms of regulatory frameworks Thank you. There needs to be the soft approach and the hard approach and the middle approach by the agencies, I suppose. So, and uh, Deirdre, would you like to comment on that question? Um, how to integrate that into the external quality assurance so, or how, how is it integrated in, in that? Sure. And as it's probably reiterating some of what I mentioned perhaps in my, my presentation, so we have taken a two part to it in Ireland as well. There is the regulatory side um, and then the enhancement side. So uh, the enhancement we've looked at, and that is about ensuring that um, that institutions have are enabled to address this topic effectively and well. And, and we've done a lot in that space and we'll continue to do so. From the regulatory side, it's ensuring that this is surfaced at an appropriately senior level, as the other two speakers have said. So um, as I mentioned, I think Brian may have mentioned in the chat, I'm sure I've seen it somewhere here. Uh, so for example, the annual um, institutional quality reports that we require from our providers, uh, academic integrity is now a dedicated field within that. And we ask institutions to tell us about what they have been doing in that space in the last 12 months, what progress they've made, what enhancement initiatives they might have undertaken, and something that we will we intend to add, another field we will add into that uh, in the next year or two is maybe perhaps some, some concrete quantitative data as well. So um, what kinds of cases, what volumes of cases, etc., cetera, are, are you identifying in that context? Um, our quality assurance guidelines that, that form their criteria informing institutional policies and procedures do make reference to academic integrity and it is a requirement that institutions have policies and procedures in place around academic integrity and that's something that we look at as part of QA approval as part of monitoring and review um, but I think something we will be looking at in, in the coming period is can we strengthen those national guidelines around academic integrity is there more that we should be saying there more that we should be requiring there um, I think what's critical, I know we've all mentioned it already, all three speakers uh, have mentioned it and it's come up in the chat, I'm pretty sure too, and that is ensuring that this is a topic that is at the senior table um, within institutions, that it is a standing agenda item for those senior academic um, committees, that there are dedicated resources at a senior level within institutions to ensure that um, those up-to-date policies and procedures are being rolled out um, effectively, that staff are resourced, are supported, um, are operating in a context whereby they feel enabled to address academic integrity effectively, to report their concerns, to pursue cases or um, of, of academic misconduct and to, to, um, to roll out those disciplinary processes where necessary and, and appropriate. Thank you. Thank you. That's very helpful. Um, there is a question about uh, preventive action. So what if an agency or a country, a system is not yet battling with the uh, SA mills, degree mills? Um, is there something that they could already do now uh, to make, make it so that it doesn't have to happen either? So um, any ideas on how to be vigilant, perhaps? Or, uh, or yeah, Gareth, do you want to go? It's, it's phrased interestingly, <laughs> that question, actually. It says, 
any suggestions for quality agencies that do not have to yet battle the writing mills? Now that almost presupposes that it hasn't happened in that jurisdiction and it probably hasn't happened on the scale that it's happened in some in countries like the UK, Australia, Ireland and the USA. But that's mainly because there's a bigger market because they are for English speaking nations. But I pretty much guarantee you that somewhere within your institutions and probably within quite a few of the institutions, there will be the use of essay mills. So firstly, don't think it's not happened yet. But what it does mean is that it hasn't reached the scale and you're in a position where everything that we've spoken about, I mean, all the, all the measures that can be taken at an institutional level, lobbying governments to take action, to take this seriously, you're in a better position because, you know, it's in some, I wouldn't say the UK has lagged behind, but we haven't maybe taken action in the way that Ireland or um, or Australia has, so that you're on the front foot. So I don't reiterate sort of some of the things that I've already talked about, about working with the sector, being proactive. I've, um, but um, it, 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 please don't think that it's not happening in your country because it will be. Good, thank you. There is a, a direct question to Aurelia. To what extent the GDPR is an obstacle to compact, combat academic misconduct? Uh, it, it seems to have raised some issues in the Netherlands. Um, so do you have any comment on that? Yes. Uh, in my last slide and in the guidelines by the uh, Academic Ombudsman, uh, Ombudsperson Institution, uh, th there was this uh, stress put on communication and on laying exactly the expectations for the behavior. And then, uh, of course, there needs to be some paperwork to be done so that there is clarity both for students and for teachers uh, for their online classes and what is acceptable and what is not. This has to be made available and very clear before everything takes place uh, um, on the internet. So, so uh, this is one issue. Another issue, yes, um, institutions were encouraged to, and actually were taking steps to update their internal guidelines, uh, both uh, in the instance when the GDPR was enacted in the first instance, but also last year when we had this particular situation. Um, well, maybe unlike to some other countries in Lithuania, there were no purely distance uh, learning programs they would be um, offered in a blended learning mode. By legislation, it is required that there is some direct physical contact between teachers and students. Uh, so they have to meet in the classes, in, in the laboratories and elsewhere. Um, there are certain requirements by law, how much uh, in terms of credits, in terms of amount of the study program, this should take place. So um, previously, there was no such a situation of pure remote teaching that we would have. And of course, when we were forced to move to this pure online teaching, uh, this has to be adapted. This had to be adapted. And from the survey that we did uh, uh, with our institutions, we know that it took time immediately to switch to online provision, it took uh, at least two weeks because the study programs, uh, and this is an important message from the experts in distance education, they have to be specifically designed for the provision online. If they are not designed in such a way, they have to be adapted. And of course, for the last spring, it was just an emergency action plan to do so. Uh, and uh, in the longer perspective, uh, there needs to be other steps taken, not just managing the biggest risks and uh, at, um, solving the issues that are directly on the table on that particular day, but in a longer perspective. So this is what we are talking with our institutions that, uh, yes, there needs to be a whole area of educational support and pedagogy for the teachers, 
because they have to be competent to provide those kind of studies, to, um, to respect the, the expectations of GDPR, also to make all those pre preventive actions uh, that would discourage all unethical behaviors and actually to stop if something is happening. They have to be equipped for that. So there's a lot of internal work for institutions to be done in this respect. Uh, thank you, Aurelia. The, Gareth also uh, just added to the chat um, to Yekaterina's uh, question um, that it, it, there is a need to engage with institutions so to make sure that they, they understand that they have to take this seriously. Um, so what I've he been hearing all morning is that we, we need the hard hand, we need to have be uh, taking serious action to combat particularly, perhaps focusing indeed what Deirdre was suggesting you know, to kind of the for-profit cheating mechanisms. Uh, it would be very difficult to ensure that nobody's uh, mom is helping them writing their thesis or, or things like that. Of course, uh, that's also cheating, but, uh, but we have to combat things in a kind of robust way. Uh, but also there's a lot of educational work to be done. And, and I do agree on that, Charity. There's a very strong say, statement to say, say to students, you are engaging in criminal activity. And I think many of them just don't see it exactly that way. Um, I mean, yeah, what's there? I mean, it's something that, you know, if a helping hand and, you know, I paid for it or there could be many explanations students give to themselves, which are not, I'm actually doing something criminal here. So, um, so I think this education at all level, institutional level, agencies, countries, students, uh, parents, whoever. So there's a lot of dialogue that needs to be had for sure. No, I have a, it's, it's, it's a question to, to everybody, uh, not only for the speakers, but they are the ones who, who only ones who have the mic open. But uh, Douglas reminded us that the ministerial uh, communique of the European Higher Education Area Ministers, um, which took place online in Rome um, in November, stated in the vision that we now have for the European Higher Education Area to 2030, um, that quality education will continue be the to be the hallmark of the European higher education area, a robust culture of academic and scientific integrity that blocks all forms of academic fraud and distortion of scientific truth will be supported by all higher education institutions and all public authorities. So it's very clearly kind of, it's in the vision of the European higher education area for the next 10 years. This is what we, we uh, all that we do has to be kind of also taking that into consideration. Uh, it's not directly calling on agencies, but clearly that's uh, that's part of the package as well. Um, and the question is, how can ENQA help, or what would you like ENQA to do to help agencies in meeting this um, this expectation or this task? So, whoever feels courageous enough to start, uh, please go ahead. Nobody's even opening their mic. Uh, Aurelia, thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Well, uh, as I just spoke about the Kacha toolkit, uh, uh, it was done in a project and very many activities were related and uh, sharing of country practices. And perhaps uh, if we could uh, come back to this issue and uh, collectively as agencies see where we stand in relation to those principles and those nine pieces of advice uh, regarding this. I think that would help to move us as an association further. Thank you, Aurelia. Any other ideas? I, I sort of read that as a question for you, Maria. <laughs> no, I'm asking you, what can Enqua do for you? <laughs> I suppose uh, Douglas was posing no. that as a board member. So uh, <laughs> he's kind of on the Enqua hat now. I, that's how I take it. So what would you expect? What would be helpful for you? Um, I, think, I, I think it's, I, I think the possibly where, where there, it does feel that there is kind of, you know, it's going to vary from country to country, but certainly within the UK, um, that there is a 
institu increasing institutional commitment and increasing feeling of the need to support agencies to support and work with their sectors in both the regulatory and enhancement way. I think what would be really important as well is that, you know, as we're talking about ministerial communique, for that to be really driven home to national governments as well, because there is a danger, and it's not just in higher education, it's in sectors generally, to talk about it and say, yes, it's a serious issue and something needs to be done about it, and then do absolutely nothing. Um, and I think that, you know, which to make it clear that from ENQA's perspective, this is a significant issue that will, one way or another, impact upon the reputation and potential credibility of national higher education systems will be a powerful message to send because that's not just coming from a national quality agency perspective, that's coming from an international perspective as well. Thanks, Deirdre. Okay, I'll bite a little. So <laughs> one of the, I suppose, the strongest regulatory tools that we have in the, in the ENQA toolkit are the ESG. And I know this isn't something that's going to happen in a minute or even the next few minutes. And the ESG do indeed make reference to academic integrity, but no more than the Irish regulatory framework that I, I mentioned previously needing to be strengthened in this, that it can be built upon perhaps as a longer term um, plan or activity, the ESG could be looked at in this regard uh, to see are there ways in which they can be strengthened to ensure that academic integrity is sufficiently surfaced and, and um, explicitly referenced within that, because that will have a knock-on effect uh, in terms of what agencies um, throughout the region will be looking at and requiring from their institutions. And the ESG have a status of prominence. I know our higher education institutions will look to them possibly even before they look to our regulatory requirements. Now, the fact that the two things are absolutely complementary, you know, so I, I think that is something that should be on the table um, as a medium to long term objective. It's very nice to hear that the ESG are so important for your oh, sector. Well, yes. I'm not sure it's the same in every country. I think there are many who have never heard of them. But it is it is true. And um, of course, there's been a lot of pressure uh, on the ESG, uh, therefore through ENQA, through the other stakeholders, through the authors of that document. Um, because it is a very effective tool. It really works. And when you, you, when you put something into the ESG, it might not be done everywhere fully immediately, but it definitely gets on the table. Um, and uh, so the policymakers would be happy uh, to put almost everything they, they hold dear into the ESG. Um, and, um, and alongside, and I, perhaps it's not actually, actually, I think it's quite linked. There's been a lot of talk about having what we call academic values more strongly in the ESG. And that's, of course, it's the other side of the coin of, uh, of uh, fraud or fraudulent behavior. So it's both, of course, an academic freedom as well, but then, uh, then also the accountability on how to use information and how to, how to use your titles, etc. So all of that. Uh, there is a, also a suggestion in the chat that Engwa could collaborate with UA, Eurasia, ESO, so the other E4 organizations to bring scale of threat to the attention of national governments and the EU, possibly emerging EU law on cybercrime could be brought to bear on SNLs. So thank you, Brian, for also that uh, suggestion. And I also had, um, before then we, we get to conclude, a, a very practical question, uh, which I'm, I don't know if you have the answer, maybe there isn't one answer. Who are the people behind the SMLs? Are, the, are we talking about failed academics? Are these criminal gangs? Uh, are these people who just would make money with, with whatever? If it's not shoes, it could be degrees or, or essays. Gareth? Yeah. Yeah, the answer is yes. <laughs> All those. Um, I mean, it's you know, it's 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 international. There are there are tiny little one person shows. There are big organised franchised essay mills. Often you will find that um, uh, academics, um, certainly for the UK experiences, that academics who are basically finding it difficult to get employment as academics, they are able to make money by doing so. Um, I think one of, so there's, there's all sorts. I mean, they, you know, they, some of these, some of these essay mills are, are what they produce is, is appalling in quality, if quality is the right word. Um, some are very, very professional up to PhD level. Um, what I think has, is really noticeable is how blatant the, not just the marketing, I've mentioned this, but the recruitment of people is. So Edgy Birdie, 
um, they the, and and others as well. Eddie Bird is a Ukrainian-based one. They advertise it. They advertise these like normal jobs. They advertise. They recruit people to um, to virtually at the moment, but um, but but obviously will will return to in person. They have open adverts recruiting people to basically go onto campuses to recruit people to use edgy birdie services is this used to be a bit surreptitious a bit kind of you know behind closed doors now it's just so open and blatant and the, you know the, the price comparison site that i showed you um demonstrates that so unfortunately there is going to be a market for people to write the danger and the difficulty is is that this is becoming more and more just normalized it's it's very regrettable. There is a very practical question. Um, also, is there any legal way to close down SA mills or diploma mills? Who could who could be able to do that? <laughs> Deidre. <laughs> Yeah, well, I, think, I, I was going to say, it I think what we can do is disrupt the business model. So from our experience, a lot of the SA mills, are ba they're not based in Ireland. They might not even be based in, in Europe. Many are based in developing countries, for example. So we can't close them down at source. But what we can do is disrupt the business model and minimise the reach into our domestic market. Um, and if lots of countries do that and we act together to do that, then we minimise their overall market um, and the pressure of that might ultimately push some of them at least out of business now look realistically are they going to change business models possibly there's going to be a little bit of that in it um, but we could certainly work look domestically and then collectively to to um, minimize their impact yeah good point thank you very much um th thank you very much for everybody who posed some questions tricky questions uh and with tricky answers as well um, and, and the speakers. Before we break off, I just wanted to detect a little bit the interest of the participants in working further on, on the um, academic uh, integrity issue. Um, so what about if we put up an ENQA working group for agencies to look closer to that? Um, so pick your Pick your ideas, pick your option there. It's anonymous, so we will not come back to you and say, oh, that's the guy who doesn't like academic integrity. Okay, and uh, Jasper, if you can um, show us uh, what people thought so we get an idea if this is something that we should uh, work a bit further on. It looked like it might be interesting that 55% might even want to contribute to that some way that would be uh, 30 people so uh, more than 30 people so that's really not bad uh, and and some most others would be really interested in hearing something more once the results are out and that's also perfectly fine of course so good we get an idea of of uh, there being a, a wish and need to keep uh, looking at this issue bringing agencies together to perhaps share some practice and to, to collaborate, to find new ways of dealing with this issue. Um, and we'll take that agenda forward. So that's all from my side. Thank you again to Aurelia, Gareth, Deirdre very much. Uh, special thanks to QAA for having brought this issue into our radar uh, and uh, suggested a webinar on this topic and thank you to the, all the participants who uh, who took part actively in this event and like I said the recording of materials and presentations will be available on our website so please be f feel free to use those and also uh, direct to your can't bye bye